Hello, so I'm Daniel Yates, and we're talking with Laura Patterson of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. You're the herpetologist, right? How does that work for <laughs> California? Because there are states without herpetologists. Yeah. Oregon's yeah. actually one of them. Yeah, Oregon's interesting because they... Uh... They have a number of people who actually work on herps up there, but they also have to work on a lot of other species. And I think uh, they basically are like regional biologists, wildlife biologists or something. Yeah. Um, well, look, California has one, me. And um, I don't necessarily consider myself a herpetologist anymore because I don't actually do any of my own research anymore. I'm, I'm a bureaucrat now. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it was a decision I made about 10 years ago to uh, hang up my my hiking boots and my waders and my dip nets and stuff and sort of come in and start working from a statewide level because I felt like um, I could get a lot more achieved at a higher level ironically it was a lateral i didn't get any extra pay for it but my responsibility went up like tenfold um and so this position i think was created maybe in the 80s and it is still um around it morphed from like a a fisheries biology or fisheries are you still there Yes, yes. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I, do, I do that. Yeah, it makes it easier to edit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. No, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you and the last one are both like the, the, the thing freezes every now and then. Oh. And hers, there was one, like I did a Beardy Mom episode. I'm, I'm editing now. And there's a moment where she's like... <gasps> Oh no! <laughs> and it on that moment is like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I won't get all weird about not being able to look at you. It's oh, that's not, okay. It's weird looking at myself, though. So. Oh my God, it is. <laughs> and hearing yourself too. Yeah. Okay, I'll try not to get distracted by me. Um. Yeah. So, I think that this might be the case in some other. Uh, states to like Nevada where they have a reptile biologist and then they have the amphibian biologist is also their fisheries biologist. And so this position that I'm in right now started out in the inland fisheries division and per fish and game code, amphibians are fish. So um, I think the, the original state herpetologist who really was a herpetologist, um, John Brode, he also worked on um, reptiles and he was actually really involved in working on giant garter snakes, which are endemic to the Central Valley. And um, I did a fair amount of work on them too before coming to this job. And um, so anyway, it's, uh, it's a, catch-all i guess i work on um regulations i am currently very late on getting a status review completed for um a petition to list the cascades frog as threatened or endangered under california's endangered species act Ooh. yeah and it was the same um, university. It was with UCLA. With, uh, do you know who uh, Dr. Brad Schaefer is with UCLA? Oh, okay. I'll look yeah, him up. I'm sorry? I'll look him up, though. Okay, yeah. He's uh, pretty well-known in these parts. And he has done probably more than anyone, not probably, he has done more than anyone on California tiger salamanders. Um, he's also a big turtle guy. I actually met him originally because I started doing my master's research on Western pond turtles. And I knew that he had a 
PhD student working on them too. And so went over to his lab and um, got some advice and the, the other turtle guy kind of went out and helped me get my study together. And, um, and they sort of made me an honorary member of the Schaefer lab. So <laughs> even though I was going to Sac State, this was at UC, he was at UC Davis, he's now at UCLA. Um, they, uh, you know, and I was just a master's student and they were all PhDs. Uh, they let me sit in on uh, their talks and, you know, getting to hear about their research or um, chapters that, of their dissertation that they were finishing. And, and then also it was really cool just then talking about um, like different interpretations of the data and like the right way to evaluate it, which is, you know, so important if you don't really understand yeah. the correct way to manage the data. Yeah. You can make some incredible uh, mistakes or um, I mean, sir, just, just yeah. like yeah. things yeah. that should not be stated with such certainty. <laughs> or, oh my you know, God, yeah. There's and that's a, the thing, communicating that to the public. Right. The public wants you to be super assertive, you know, super like right. this is 100% correct. And it's like the real world never works in 100% correction. Right. I'm, uh, I'm here in Missouri. So we actually have good like uh, like laws for, uh, we actually have a tax that the people voted on to pay for conservation in the state. I, I heard actually, Arkansas has that as well, right? I don't know about Arkansas. I haven't really been able to get a hold of them, but I know we do. And I got mm -hmm. to meet uh, our state herpetologist. I interviewed him and it's just blown away by the stuff that he does. And it's so different to, to talk to somebody like that. I went the other day for, uh, we've got one of the, uh, for a school, Wash U, Washington University in St. Louis, is like 43rd in the country for physics. Hmm. That's to break the top 50 and to mm -hmm. not be a national name necessarily. Right. So I went over there because they were giving a talk on, uh, I always get this incorrect, a phenyl group. So it's a P H E N O L. Oh, uh, like phenology? Yeah. Right, so timing of... But yeah, uh, they, were, they were just like, it was so fascinating. They were like, no, it's data science. And this is really rare for biologists to do data science correctly. Okay. We always have to call somebody else in. Oh, I like, see, that they actually get to do it themselves, you mean? Yeah, they actually yeah. have an outsour a weird outsourcing. CVT or something like that, they called it, where it's actually people are actually able to edit it. And what they're doing is they're using computer programs to map plants the way they grow. Mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating to me because I have a degree in physics. I learned, I actually computer programmed chaos theory like we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. I've done that. Like it's really fascinating to how that actually plays out computer wise. And I love data. I've done some data in communication stuff like some quantitative, qualitative studies. Uh, and I spent a month on like 80 questions for a job satisfaction survey that I did. And I loved it. Oh, it was so <laughs> wonderful. But it's, it's so fascinating. I'm not a fan. I, I'm a terrible writer. I'm great at putting studies together. I'm a terrible at spelling and writing. And so as a child, I was labeled learning disabled because of that. Mm -hmm. I my degrees show you that I'm not like learning disabled. I actually right. learned so fast that it's like I, my brain just can't comprehend it anymore because it's so simple that it's like just goes woo. You know, my, I'm like, oh, look over there. I can do that. Like I can do that. And it's just like it just goes so fast. And like going there and talking to people about reptiles and stuff, about lighting and stuff, things that they don't actually know. And when you so I don't have any intentions on going and doing writing for academia stuff, but going back and meeting academia people, has, like I loved it. 
they were so passionate like why yeah. is that important oh that's really cool like really like so that so nobody knows that like that's really like oh my god yeah like oh wow like you just it's so ingrained yeah and they're they are uh you know they've taken higher level classes so they have a like deeper understanding of a lot of the theories and and applying the theories and um i think it's just really cool because i went to uc davis as um for my undergrad so and i was a little disillusioned with it because I felt like it was far too theoretical and wanted to get a job in wildlife biology. I didn't want to go on to be a professor. Um, and so it was cool being able to go to Sac State where apparently their undergrad program is very tied to applied biology. And um, so going there for my master's work, but then also um, getting to sit in on the Schaefer Labs discussions about their herp, and it's all herp stuff, um, just really cool. Uh, I, I felt so like, lucky <laughs> to be part of it. I felt like a poser. I think probably a lot of people have imposter syndrome, <laughs> but man, oh man, did I when I was sitting there. But what was really never, cool, I'm sorry, go ahead. Never in school did I get imposter syndrome. It was my last job that gave me imposter syndrome was a startup pharmaceutical company. Mm. And that's what I was doing there was lab work. And I don't know, it was just so toxic that it gave me that. Oh. Uh, I love what you're talking about here. This is something I preach. When you go for something, go for the next level up. Like if you want to, uh, there's a Virginia guy who does this. He's on NPR network thing, hmm. not NPR, M PR. Oh. Okay. Um, Moralia Python Radio, he does some of their stuff. So it's a, kind of a niche thing. They, they're they not going to get too far besides breeders necessarily. But he actually runs a program for zookeeping in Virginia. Well, the thing is, he, as a master's, you don't just learn zookeeping. You learn administration. Right. And to me, that's like, no, that's exactly what I preach. Don't just learn your one little topic, advance to the next level because you can always step down, but you can't always step up. Yeah. So absolutely yeah. do the next step. Yeah. I had um, similar advice when I was entering UC Davis from the chair of the Wildlife and Fisheries Department I wanted to go the they had like seven different um, sort of emphases that you could choose from and you had to choose one. And so I chose conservation biology and the chair basically said, you really um, should also go for wildlife ecology because the conservation biology curriculum didn't have any plant classes and she was just like, if you want to get a job, you got to know the plants too. And uh, so I did, I did like a, a double, whatever emphasis on um, conservation and wild biology and wildlife ecology. And sure enough, uh, my first job in the field involved a lot of vegetation mapping and, um, and bird surveys, mostly looking at the success of some mitigation properties that had been constructed and set aside to um, offset some impacts to habitat when people were reinforcing their levees. It was out in, we have a big uh, Delta, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. And so I would not have gotten that job if I did not know my plants. <laughs> And I actually ended up loving the plant taxonomy class. I mean, it was so cool. It was really challenging, but so cool. 
I'm so glad I got a hold of you then than somebody else out of the fish and wildlife because you can see a difference in just the base biologist that's out there in the field and like uh, our our state herpetologist. Uh, for some reason, I just I'm blanking on his name, but mm -hmm. he was just like one of the like when you interview him, you are not talking to just somebody that does the work you are talking to somebody because that's what it feels like it feels like most of these people in that do this kind of stuff are just here for the job and that makes sense like there's no there's no you're bad for that it's like no no it's a job it takes so much out of you so much effort you don't want to come home and be a keeper yourself there's right. so much to it but you, you actually come with so much more experience and you can just see it in the way you talk about it. Like you're like, no, I automatically, like this is the, I was happy this, this, this is what this. So this is a very good lesson for people at home to understand that if you're gonna do this, you don't just go get the basic degree. Right. You get something more, you get in the training, you will have to absolutely 100% do field work and get a master's. Yeah, I, I think probably for a position like mine, I, I'm trying to think if anyone who is like a statewide conservation coordinator like me, because we have sort of uh, similar people for raptors and um, and small mammals and I'm trying to think. Then there a bunch, a lot of the other ones are kind of broken up among a bunch of other people. But um, yeah, I think we all have masters. But I think that, but that's part of it too, is because you, I'm not saying you have to get a degree to do this. I, I think that people can on their own probably learn about like study design and, um, and you know, correct data interpretation. I don't know that you necessarily need to go to school to do that, but I I needed to do that. And yeah, if and, you're going to work for the conservation agency, you actually have to. Most of the states have to have a master's degree if you're going to do what you're doing. But I fully agree. I use my channels to often do psychological studies. Mm -hmm. I never went into psychology because I. To me, it was so simple. Like I'd go to class and I'd answer the questions, but I would just do so horribly on the tests and mm -hmm. stuff because it's all writing. Oh, I'm yeah. not a great writer, so it's like, okay, so no, but it's not that I don't understand it. And so I actually, and it, like I said before, I have actual studies in communication, which is a social science. So me putting a study together like there's people out there who go, well, you're not qualified because you don't have the degree. No, I'm more than qualified because I know how to put the study together. It's not necessarily that I have the degree that matters. It's do you know how to use it? The difference between what, what is it? Chaos and science is writing it down or something like that. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's, that, I mean, it's as simple I, as that. I think I'm still in the chaos mode with my status for you. <laughs> <laughs> such writer's block it's awful oh god i i actually do understand that i've i've thought about writing up my stuff and went no if i wrote it up it would be such a horrible thing and for some people yeah they want that validation when i'm like to me it's like no just go to my channel and look at my stuff if you don't want to put in that work then i don't i don't really have time like it's, it's literally there like you can put your own paperwork together off of my stuff. I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's well, like, unfortunately with our stuff, yes. there's definitely a hierarchy in, in how credible certain sources are when you are trying to put together supporting evidence for your conclusion. So, you know, like at the end of this report, I have to make a recommendation to the Fish and Game Commission, who's the body that actually makes the decision on whether or not to list the species. So I have to come up with the recommendation to list the species or not, and then whether it should be listed as threatened or endangered if I do think that it warrants protection. 
and of course it's not just me we we um you know it goes through like multiple layers of internal and external peer review so um but that is one of those things where a report that i get and i get a lot of them because um everyone who is doing research in california either gets a permit from me i am the one who issues all of the permits for the amphibians and reptiles that are listed as threatened or endangered under the California Endangered Species Act. And then we require a scientific collecting permit for handling all the other native herbs. And so everyone who's doing that is required to send me an annual report on you know, what they've been up to. And so I get a lot of reports, but without the peer review and the publication, you know, it's like, it's hard to use some of that. And, I'll, and some of it's really awesome and, and it should be published. And um, it's just, it takes a lot of time and sometimes it's expensive depending on, you know, what what journal you're, you're going for. Yeah, it's I kind agree. It's prohibitive in some ways. Yeah, oh my God, yes. Uh, that, that takes me to what I was like, uh, you sent me some stuff. Well, you didn't really send me much, but uh, I looked, was reading through the stuff, and I like, I have a lot of people that come on here and they haven't done any of their research on me, so they oh. have no idea what to expect. And it's like, okay, so, uh, so, but I do do my own, and like, I, you sent me a link, or you were talking about, uh, 14. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Title 14 of the California Code of Regulations. Yeah, what I was finding on that was fish, but that makes sense to what you were talking about was the main thing that I found. I went further deeper and found the reptile stuff, and it's the only thing I could really find on the website is about if you're going to the breeder's permit oh yeah the uh anything that's actually imported transported sold propagated oh. as native reptiles actually have to have this permit mm -hmm. how yeah. does that work um people apply for it <laughs> Huh? A lot of people don't and just do it. What's the uh, what's the consequences and stuff for that? What's um, I don't know because I don't know if how many people actually get uh, you know found out. Um, yeah. And I think it probably depends on on what they're doing and how they communicate with the warden whether the warden and probably and obviously like the health of the animals if it's clear that they're being neglected they'll get seized and okay. taken to a, a, a vet or a zoo or a zoo's vet you know someone yeah. who people who can hopefully either nurse them back to health or euthanize them humanely you know if they're in really bad shape but um you know they may just tell them that they need to get, you know, this permit and they will come back in a month. And if they don't have the permit, then they're going to cite them and seize their animals. I assume that that's kind of how it works, but I don't really know. I don't, you know, law enforcement doesn't want to tell you any more than they need to because of the sensitivity of it being you know, an enforcement case. And okay. so um, yeah, the, the Roy guy that I that I was wanting to have on too, he's got a bigger following than me. So more people would have seen this mm -hmm. if he was on. So that was one of the things. And he is actually from California. So mm -hmm. those things. So one of the questions that he had, and this was very important, what we're talking about right now is the amount of people, because California is so dense with people how does that affect all of this? How does that affect the conservation? Like, just, yeah. As you can imagine, it is really hard. It is really hard. Uh, 
as many environmental laws and regulations as California has, they can't compete with 40 million people um, and climate change. And the fact that we live in this Mediterranean climate where in the warmest parts of the year, we get no precipitation. So we have to dam all of these rivers to have supply for you know, municipalities, residents, agriculture, you know, industry. And so it's a very manipulated system. And the more people build out, the more difficult that becomes because you've got your wildlife urban interface, you know, stretching out. The closer you are to that, the more likely you're going to get a spark from something, more wildfires. Um, you know, we just had our first really good wet year in many, many years. And it's been so dry. And it's Maybe really too wet, though. But yeah, it could be. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's part of the problem with climate change is that maybe the averages aren't going up that much. You know, they're going up slowly, but it's the variability that is really going up. The severity and the length, you know, the duration of these droughts and then uh, interrupted by how many atmospheric rivers has California had this year? I mean, it's ridiculous. I didn't it's, even know what, oh, what, what was the other one? It's like a, what's it called? A something bomb? Like, they're coming up with terms that don't sound so good for the amount of precipitation we're getting. <laughs> no, there was, there's a joke that I heard years ago. Since I'm in St. Louis, understand like last June or July, we had a massive flood here. Oh yeah, yeah. It was like it was it, it it was horrible. On my ride to work, literally, there was cars in the fields. Oh man, where we would grow crops and stuff, where there was trucks, actual SUVs that had the water up to their roof. Like you could only see the roof in like an inch of the actual windshield. That's scary. And it's like yeah, no, it, it's all like in one night. Yeah. There's a there's an old joke. It's because uh, I would I would holler at Roy when this stuff started happening with the rains and stuff. It's like, are you OK, man? Like, I know you're in California. I know we don't know each other that well, but are you OK? Because I know this is a big thing like this is and it's a, a old lady or a newspaper news lady went to a farm and she's like, it says here you had problems with your crop last year, but it says you got 29 inches of rain. <laughs> right. And he goes, yeah, I remember the night it happened. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. People don't understand when you're talking about climate change, it's not just about the heat. Right. The, the way the, the water lifts up changes where it will drop next. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the more you have it in an area and it's evaporating, the next time it's still dropping, but in more massive quantities in a place where it normally wouldn't drop. Right. And we've got how many hundreds of miles of coastline, too. So, yeah. it's, you know, yeah, it's I think very, very uh, influenced. By, you know, by isn't, ocean it, isn't it Cali if the actual waters got high enough California is gone all the way to the like, middle of Nevada or something like that I don't think that could happen be well maybe if it went around like the very northern part of the Sierra Nevada through Lassen and back down but I don't think they're getting over like 10,000 foot peaks or more. Yeah, I know the uh, the last ice age, my understanding was that it didn't, I don't think the ice age got halfway through uh, California the way it set, but the, the mm. edge of it. Yeah, I don't, oh I mean, yeah, I, I don't it, know. I mean, I, mean, I know that we have glaciers pretty far down. 
of course they're melting but but then halfway through california what does that really mean yeah, i mean it's, it's like it's right. a long thing yeah yeah it's a very yep so yeah kind of off the cusp kind of a more funnier topic since we were talking about amphibians and the fish <laughs> i heard a story once that you guys had to eventually put bees as fish yeah so i mean it's because the in fish and game code that definition of fish has not just amphibians it also has invertebrates so it says like i think mollusks invertebrates amphibians fish i can't remember it also has crustaceans but anyway i don't remember who petitioned the commission to list these four bumblebee species but whoever it was was testing out whether or not the department could protect insects and vertebrates um under the California Endangered Species Act, because it had been the department's policy since inception that they didn't, with the exception of three species that got listed, maybe like when the act was originally created in. Uh, 71 or 72, it was um, California freshwater shrimp, Shasta crayfish, and Trinity bristle snail or something like that. The snail's the only one that's terrestrial. The other two are aquatic. So the aquatic ones I could see, you know, being in the, in the um, definition of fish. But I mean, the same thing that could be said for amphibians. I mean, we have how many I mean, dozens of, of tracheoseps of sl slender salamanders. We have lots and lots of lungless salamanders that are purely terrestrial. So fisheries branch doesn't do anything with those. <laughs> it's it's really fascinating how that works. That's really something else because uh, making laws in different states, I'm actually trying to there, there's a couple of laws I think that should be passed because when you're talking about laws, bans don't usually work unless the public has already accepted the outcome. And that's if it if they haven't, then the ban is just like almost never going to work. Like you said, they just they just won't tell you, and it's mm -hmm. so hard to keep up with that. So so for me, it's okay. So the best thing to do is to put this little rock in your path and force you to have to think about going left or right around it, that's probably the best option. You're still going to go around it. You're just actually putting more thought into what the hell you're doing than just something just off the cusp. This is why thinking about a license program for anything, just to kind of make people think more. That's literally all it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to fix all the problems. It's right. just supposed to correct some of the issues Another thing is, since some of the stuff that's happening around the country with reptiles and stuff, we uh, talk, I'm going to talk to a lawyer guy. Hopefully, I'll have him on the show sometime and talk about uh, to, uh, what it would really mean to change pets from property to something else, to actually like that. There, There's actually something in... Quebec, Canada, or not Quebec, uh, Columbia, British Columbia and Canada. They're working something out like that. It would change the way we would see animal abuse and all sorts of... Like they would stuff. have more rights than they do right now? Is that... Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it wouldn't just be, you know, you just, you trade, like if a, a couple got divorced, then they would go, okay, so the dog... I would pay you $50 for the dog and I would get to keep it. Whereas now it's okay. The judge can go, okay, so you're going to go live on a farm and I'm going to go live in a high rise apartment. That dog needs to go to the farm that, but then there's so many other issues that comes with that as well. 
And it's not just as simple as that. It sounds great to a point, but is the judge educated enough? Is the people educated right. enough? We might want to look at actually fixing internally some of our issues as a community to make that work properly. But then does that give us more rights for the animals? It's, I don't know, it's an interesting legal thing. It's, I'm not a lawyer for a reason. I, I'm with <laughs> people. I, I hate all this legal jargon, but I know how important it is. I, I'm not a biologist. I don't define a lot of things, but when you're talking about data, you have to define stuff. You have to be like this. My boss was talking to me the other day and he's like, yeah, you know, we called in a statistician to read us the data that we had collected on this product. And I'm sitting here in my head going, you, you had to call somebody else to read your data? Like, what? Like, I just, I'm just, I'm trying to do that. Like, what? Like, what? That's, that's why I'm here. Like, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you should just tell me. I'll, I'll show you. Like, I, I know. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating how all that works because you're correct. The data reading and everything. But those are so much further down the line. So, like, how would you get a law created in in uh, your state? So there's two different layers. The laws are actually um, found under Fish and Game Code. And those are written by the legislature and then signed by the governor to become enacted, similar to federal laws. Um, but then normally the laws are pretty basic and so they need regulations to be built around them. The regulations lay out more of the details about how that law will be implemented. And so the Fish and Game Commission is the body that uh, changes the regulations or adopts regulations. Um, and they are appointees from governors. I think they, I not remember if they have like five year terms or something. But anyway, there is a way for people to actually petition the commission to make a regulation change. So um, it's the way that we get petitioned for a species to be listed under uh, the California Endangered Species Act. It's like the most recent one I worked on, um, well, that, that actually turned into a new regulation was um, some guys in Southern California wanted to develop pharmaceutical products from native snake venom. I don't know if you know about the Southern Pacific rattlesnake venom. It's a combination of, or in some areas, it's got hematoxin and neurotoxin. And in some areas, it's just hematoxin. But it's very dangerous, the areas where it has the neurotoxin as well. And so they wanted to create like vaccines for dogs and horses, basically domestic animals. Um, but because we are really strict on commercial use of native wildlife, there wasn't a way for them to do that. And so we had to write a new regulation that allowed for commercial use of native rattlesnakes for the purpose of creating, you know, new pharmaceutical therapies. And um, that came through a petition for regulation change. See, that's, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I mentioned in the one video that there's so much leftover science to do and stuff that it's really fascinating how much we don't know about some of this stuff and like it's really fascinating because i would the, the degree i have would deal with synthetic polymers and synthetic pharmaceutical stuff 
one lady from university, I think it was uh, Oklahoma, state Oklahoma University came to our college and was talking on a plant that literally farmers burn it because it's a weed, but yet Indians used to smoke it. Hmm. And it turned out that the properties in it had anti-cancer properties. Oh, wow. But when you look at the molecule, you'd be like this. And their synthetic version of the molecule was like this. Oh, wow. Because when you actually realize what they have to do, for one, you have manufacturing. That's going to change the size because this took billions of years to get to. Mm -hmm. So manufacturing changes, and then they add things to it to make it even better. Mm -hmm. But yet it still has to fit in the same gap in your DNA mm -hmm. as this does. Hmm. So it's really fascinating how that yeah. actually works. And that so, is. yeah, it's, and it was really cool. Uh, chromatids, uh, I went to a university, Washington University up here had a conference, science conference, and it was so, the guy was so monotone. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, was no. University of Illinois, but he actually showed video of chromatids moving proteins along your DNA oh. strand. And they move three steps forward, two steps back. Hmm. So fascinating. It's like, you don't think about that actually being a creature in itself. Because it just because it's tiny, it's not actually microscopic. It's still in the macro world. You can see it with a microscope. That's crazy. It is. It's quite fascinating how all that works. But just to think of it, uh, the blue M&M &M dye looks like uh, the Star Trek Enterprise. That's the shape of the actual molecule. Oh, <laughs> like, I thought it was silver. <laughs> okay, got it's, it. <laughs> it's pretty wild how like just because they synthetic synthesized mm -hmm. it back in the 90s. It was very, very interesting. And it is bigger than all the other colors because they had to synthesize it. Mm. Oh, interesting. It's, yeah, it is. And so keeping these animals alive for that reason alone and conservation yeah. efforts. So what are some of the things that people can do for conservation in besides, cause uh, one of the things that I saw was the volunteer tax contribution <laughs> fund thing. And I'll leave all those in the description. I always leave the, the stuff oh. that I found in the description. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see people do more is get more involved in the decisions that the commission is making. There's a really easy way to stay up to date with what they are working on. Um, if you go to their website, with, which is just F fish G game C commission dot CA dot gov. I think it's like right on the right side, there's a thing that says subscribe and you can subscribe to all of these different topics. Like if you wanna get notified about- um, Send me that link and I'll put it, any link that you want. Okay. In the yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah so I mean, they are, so it, they will uh, be the ones who hear the department give the presentation on their recommendation on whether or not to list a species. They uh, are they work on hunting regulation changes, fishing regulation changes. Um, like I said, the, the commercial native rattlesnake change. Um, one big one that they have been working on for years that I think is finally going to see the light of day hopefully this year, is um, a petition to ban importation of live bullfrogs and non-native turtles. And um, I think that Washington and Oregon have already done that. There were numerous teams that got together because they wanted to do a public scoping that was very thorough. 
talking to industries that might be, well, that would be affected by it, talking to environmentalists who, you know, their angle is uh, protecting native species from the diseases and competition and predation that can come along with releases, which is ultimately what we're trying to you know, get rid of. <laughs> and so, um, and then obviously the, the agencies, the regulatory stuff. So we invited um, Oregon and Washington to participate and also um, the city of Santa Cruz, one of the people who works there, they had actually banned uh, bullfrogs in their city years ago. And so um, he came along and you know helped with thinking about the implications of different kinds of regulations, like how far do you go um, and who would be affected and how would it be enforced? Would it, you know, would it actually do any good? And uh, so it's really interesting stuff. It was, uh, mm -hmm. makes your brain hurt after a while. <laughs> yeah, one of, the, one of the biggest things that like just surprises me is I'm in Missouri. Missouri is not the, the greatest place in the world, but our conservation is lit. We're, our conservation's solid that's awesome and like you said we actually found tax money literally the people passed the law they signed up to pay taxes for yep. conservation yep you would think california would already have that this is why i want to reframe a lot of these issues the way i i talk about it i talk about some of this stuff really weird even i'm a little uncomfortable about the way I frame some of this stuff in some of my videos. But there's a reason. Like, I'm not just, like, talking out my butt. Like, I'm, like, yeah. going, yeah, let's look at this as a reframing of stuff because <laughs> conservation is something that's massively important to us all. And it's really fascinating. California was something else because, I mean, you guys got everything from redwoods to desert mm -hmm. and every single thing in between. Yeah. Mountaintops and freaking below sea level yep what's that like dealing with herps when you're dealing with so many different levels it's um i mean challenging is like an understatement right especially I, if you're one what's that especially if you're one yeah well so we obviously have to rely on our partners a lot and um we do have some people who work on reptiles and amphibians in our regional offices. So it's not like I'm the only person in the department who is working on them, but I'm the only one in the department who's working on them at a statewide level. So for instance, the mountain yellow-legged frogs in Southern California are the same species as the mountain yellow-legged frogs in the Southern Sierra. But in the Southern Sierra, they also have the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog. That So basically, the partners managing the frogs in the Sierra Nevada just manage those areas. And then the SoCal people manage theirs, and they don't talk. And so, I'm constantly trying to move information between the two, like, hey, we're doing this in Southern California. I've thought about doing it over here, you know, and um, never a dull moment. But it's also one of those things where I get burnt sometimes because I want to do it all and I can't. And it's really hard for me to prioritize which species I'm going to work on. There are so many species that have been neglected, understudied. And, the, there, and the reason why is I don't have any partners. I can't. Is there any way that. the public could help? Because I know a lot of states at least have websites or phone numbers to call that if you found a herb or something, 
It's just to at least identify it and map it. At least that. I mean, yeah. do, what do you guys have anything like that? Yeah. So that's actually something I should mention is uh, this is not for necessarily live animals to document them, but um, we do have a mortality reporting website. And um, I think that that's really important for people to know about because we're very worried about the new disease coming in. We have, I think like, you know, three major ports, San Francisco, LA and San Diego. And it just seems like B cell is probably going to get here eventually, you know, and so we need people to be looking out for sick animals. This, animals. this, this is going to be a clip. Okay. This is absolutely something. There's so many people out there that think that pet keepers releasing animals is the number one danger. And like, I actually preach about quarantining your animals and doing things like that and how to deal with that. Like you're better off not having substrate, even if it's an animal that buries itself during quarantine because you can keep it actually sanitary and it's actually less dangerous in the long run it, when you throw it away because most people aren't going to use bio bags. Right. But you're talking about the importers you're talking about the actual bays where these animals may sit on a dock yeah. for a freaking month <laughs> well maybe i don't know if they'll be there that long but i mean it is you know they're co it'll come in one way or another i mean we're pretty sure that well actually i don't know if we know that bd came in on bullfrogs but i think there's pretty strong evidence that that is the case um, because it's when they basically ate up all of the California red-legged frogs, which is our biggest ranted, well, our, our biggest frog totally. And, he, and um, they just started importing bullfrogs. And so you can kind of like map a, the spread of uh, chytrid across the landscape from sort of these areas that had lots of bullfrog farms or markets like around San Francisco. Um, so anyway, it's just one of those things where I would love for more people to know about the, you know, mortality reporting. And we also work um, with the National Wildlife Health Center in Madison, Wisconsin. I think it's uh, run by USGS. And so they're really great when we have, like someone just found some California tiger salamander larvae that looked nasty. They had um, like blisters on them and like really red raw skin. And um, the biologist who found them thinks that might be ranavirus, which I have never seen ranavirus in California. I'm sure it occurs here, but in all of the work that I did with amphibians, I never saw it. I don't read, I don't, like no one has said ranavirus. And so I wonder it's, if that's a new thing. And speaking of new things, we got our first hits of snake fungal disease in 2019. And uh, yeah, so um, my colleague in the, our wildlife health lab, she's the non-game veterinarian, Dr. Deanna Clifford. She and I put together a grant federal money, of course, to do surveillance throughout California to see how widespread snake fungal disease is. And fortunately, it doesn't seem very widespread. We've only found, I think, one more area than we knew about in that uh, in Bay Area. I, I left the camera on me. I, I'm way past my bedtime. I'm oh, sorry. But, no, no, you're fine. No, this is great. No, no, the look on my face should tell the audience how important this actually is. This is not a face of somebody who's just going, oh, what do you say I'm talking? I'm going, no, what? Like, this is important stuff. We're yeah. just, I'm just now getting to the point of, because I don't keep snakes. Yeah, but I'm just now figuring out that there is actually home tests 
for mm -hmm. some of the actual common, massively dangerous diseases that snakes get that people will often have mm -hmm. in big collections because they don't do their own due diligence and do the work to put that in there because it's extra money. So you could be getting a diseased animal that, and so there's a lot of this stuff here. So if that's actually in an industry where there's money being changed hands, when you're talking about underfunded, yeah. It, I mean, just imagine how much is actually slipping through the cracks. So actually mapping the amount of that are dying may actually be helpful data when you have that sort of problem. And yeah. I never thought about the actual importing of them coming through the dock systems of California. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, I don't think that they're being they're not being released right from there but no you don't have to but it's but i mean yeah they're well, they're getting into system. other people's hands who decide that they don't want to keep them anymore but they don't want to kill them or they don't want to give them away so they just release that them does, i mean even i mean even looking at it as okay so you bring in a group of it and they the majority have a disease Mm -hmm. then how long does that disease sit on a surface? How yeah. fast does that disease spread from that surface? It's guaranteed that that thing has air holes. Otherwise, that person's yeah. going to lose their whole stock. So yeah. therefore, the disease can get out of it. And then how long will that disease, because when you're dealing with viruses or even like I work for bear crop science, when we create stuff to put on seeds, we, and you're talking about biology, you have to feed it. So therefore, if there's something in that container ship, anywhere near it, that it can feed off of, it survives longer. Then it gets passed to any type of food that's coming through, anything that's coming through it. You're talking about massive stuff here mm -hmm. in an open air space. A bird comes down and grabs a freaking lobster that just walked on something that touched it five minutes ago. That the shipment container there was a rock that fell off a shipping container. It had it on it. The crab walked over it. The bird ate it. The bird pooped. <laughs> and now you've got this thing out there in the wild. It sounds far-fetched to, to go through that many systems, and you're probably going to have something in that system that stops it eventually. But life finds a way, right? I mean... Yeah, right. I mean, the, the whole... Yeah. Like the, you know, a major premise of invasion ecology is propagule pressure right so it may be that the likelihood of something that like what you just described is really minute but then you look at the number of animals that are coming in like i'm pretty sure california imports like two million bullfrogs a year so there are lots of opportunities for those to get out and not even the scenario that you described where you know it's something getting on a bird's foot and moving around which can happen yeah. and ha and and we think in some ways chytrid might have been spread through birds you know basically landing in infected water bodies and, and moving on because it can live in moist soil for a very long time. And this goes, this all goes back to, if you're talking about this mathematically, we would talk about this in terms of actual chaos theory, hmm. an equilibrium. Chaos theory is not just a butterfly flaps its wings and a hurricane. <laughs> it's no, there's actual equilibrium. Everything has to come to an equilibrium. And that's the other part of invasiveness is when does it stop being invasive and it becomes part of the ecological system? 
Yeah, that I don't. Yeah, that's. <laughs> we haven't, as far as I know, we have not gotten there in California. Um, I mean, when you look at humans, we could just say that about us. Like, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, I think, uh, well, particularly European Americans, right? Um, I think uh, may happen is that. Well, I mean, I think what's already happening is we have to choose our battles. I am in constant triage mode because there's so much going on. I have to like reevaluate my my cue like every day because so much is going on. And so basically for a lot of these introduced invasive species, we can't do anything about them. They're there. I mean, the amount of effort it would take to make a dent and then maintain that is beyond our capacity. And so I don't know if we would want to define them as naturalized, um, but I mean, they are. We'd never start treating them as native species, but it might be the case, what well, would be the case, I think, that we would probably never do a full-blown slider eradication anywhere near an urban or suburban center number one it wouldn't take people will keep continue you know keep releasing their sliders but also can you imagine the public outcry you're killing people's pets you know like they don't keep them anymore but we that can was just actually our worst that. nightmare you know we we actually can't imagine that uh I don't know if I actually want to talk about this. Oh. It's a very touchy topic. What's happened in Florida? Oh, the with man, the, uh, the, the uh, pythons, uh -huh. the, the killing of that uh, boa and all that shit. I hear people that don't even keep reptiles. And when I talk to them about it, they're like, yeah, I heard about that. Like, I, oh yeah, no, like it's, it's a lot more mainstream than people think. Sure. And it's like, there's an outcry like they're like no we want somebody's head for this Ugh. like somebody i don't know i mean i yeah i i understand where they're coming from but yeah that, and that is... goes back to pass to actually at least having a conversation about changing pets to away from property is actually a valid conversation right now to have to see where that would go wrong or where that would go right. What benefits would that be? What negatives could that be? How could we get that to where it would actually work properly in the favor of the animals instead of just using it as a law against people? It, how do you do, how do you shift all that? This is where talking to the lawyers where it's gonna be very nice to have that and at least have that conversation started. Yeah, there's... Um... See, when I talk about shit, it's I want to talk about 10 years from now. Everybody else can be mad right now, but if we don't have a plan for 10 years down the road, do we really have anything to talk about after we're done? Because once you get what you want, you're just leaving everything to its own devices and you don't really have a leg to stand on anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, there will always be work to do in in wildlife conservation, for sure. Oh, my God, yeah. So, now, uh, do you keep anything personally? No. I didn't I think so. Have. I, but uh, when I was, like, seven or eight, someone came to our school with a boa, and um, I was like, man, that thing looks really cool. And um, so the guy's like, anyone want to hold it? And all the kids were like, eh, I want to hold it. And so uh, I held, it was like five feet. I was probably three feet, you know? And um, I was so like in love with it. I asked Santa for a boa. <laughs> <laughs> Santa didn't bring me a boa. <laughs> <laughs> were my parents right because oh my god i 
would not have been uh, equipped to take care of that animal <laughs> the way that it needed to. And I'm sure they did not want to take care of a boa. I'm so, sure. uh, yeah. And then I, I realized I, I ended up with an aquarium with some decent, like, you know, kind of not high end fish or whatever. Yeah. And I was so bad about like getting the chemistry right. And my fish were committing suicide. They were like jumping out of the tank and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm good with cats. Cats are really easy. So that's all <laughs> I got. Yeah. I, I kill plants. I cannot keep anything oh. but a cat alive. So. I'm a brilliant scientist and I have trouble keeping plants alive sometimes. <laughs> and it's like, I literally work in the agricultural industry. And it's like, are you like, I, I'm just flabbergasted. And it's like, I, I literally, I even sit here and I even break it down in my head. It's like, okay, so I need to know the pH of this and we need to work on the water of this and like this, and like this. And it's like, ah, but it, damn it. I can't even keep a pothos alive. <laughs> I know. I just, you know what? I had to admit that there are things I am just really not good at. Yeah. And and that's okay. That, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't focus on the fact that I'm, you know, bad at keeping plants and a number of other things. I'm going to focus on the things that I'm pretty good at and uh, keep doing those and hopefully stay good at them and and they bring me joy like i love my job it just sort of kills me sometimes <laughs> oh yeah the stress that you have to be under and just the the constant and like you said you have to have communication skills when there's just no way mentally you should have communication skills because the hours and yeah it's 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 a struggle so having other people learn communication skills is some of the best things that you could have it's like having people understand where you're coming from this is why i've had quite a few people herpetologists from different states send me the answers to the questions and i'm like that's not what you wanted <laughs> yeah that's, there's a reason why i want you to show your face yeah. And that is to humanize you as an right. individual. I mean, it's like, yeah, you show well, that. You know, I, I wanted to say something about the communication thing, because um, my mom was a nurse on a, a closed psych ward. And while she was working there, she ended up meeting my stepdad, who is a clinical psychologist. And so I got psychologized all the time as a teenager. <laughs> Laura, why did you feel the need to break curfew? You know, and interestingly enough, I think that really helped me in reading people and and understanding what they need so that I can get what I need. You know, like, do they need validation? Do they need help? Um, what, how do we come to a solution together? And I really do like, I hated it when I was young, but now I'm like, yeah. they're so great that they made me think about like, I'm like, I'm a teenager, but you know, but yeah. it doesn't mean that all teenagers are rebellious or have to, you know. Yeah be that so way many but... adults i mean especially once you pass that 30 most of them are set in their ways and it's no you need to meet me where i'm at wait a second wait a second here wait a second i need to meet you where you're at i've put more time and effort than you have even though you don't know me i've still done more than you why are you telling me i have to meet you i i so wish that I could do that, but yeah, um, it's really, but I but can't. As an actual person that has to communicate with the public, you can't just look at somebody and go, shut the hell up. I know more than you. Like, what is it? The, the guy from Parks and Rec, when he walks through the Home Depot and the guy walks up to him and goes, can you need some, stop. I know more than you. 
I can't remember. It's Nick Offerman, but I can't remember what yeah. he's uh, what his character's name is. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> and it was, you know, it's funny that you say that because um, a breeder in I think Florida contacted me about our importation rules because he had a buyer in California for uh, it was a subspecies of common garter snake, which we have subspecies of common garter snakes in California, including San Francisco garter snake, which is arguably the prettiest snake alive. Um, and so I laid it out for him and said that the only way that he could import you know, that guy export, but the person who wanted to buy it and board it is if it's an albino and fits the description of the albino in regulation, which is basically lacking pigment and having red eyes. And, oh, that's right. It wasn't just the garter snake. No, I think I'm thinking of two different people. This guy actually wanted to send a Western diamondback rattlesnake. And so then he... He said, uh, "Well, I have some, I have some albino rattlesnakes," and I'm like, "Well, do they, they have red eyes? Because that's what this says." <laughs> and um, so he's like, "Okay, I'll just tell the buyer that I can't." And the so then he comes back and he's like, "The the buyer is insisting that um, that's not the rules." And I said, "You came to me because you wanted to know." I know the most about herp regulations out of the entire department, probably the entire state, probably the entire world. I, you want to you send it to him? Go for it. I'm, you asked me, I told you. He's like, no, 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 I believe you. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. are you really coming back to me with this, man? I, I was like, I was putting the regulations in there. I was highlighting the areas where the regulations basically prohibit what he's talking about. I gave him everything. I'm just happy that he actually contacted you. Like that's, right. exactly. that's the sad and, and part. That's, like it's like. Oh, totally. When people do, I thank <laughs> them up and down. I was like, you know what? I so appreciate that you checked. I hate that I have to deliver this message to you. Yeah. But, and, you, and know. you did something there that I don't think enough people listen to. The fact that you, your, the way memory works is every time you look at it in your head, it changes. The amount that it changes is debatable, but it, it's always a lie because you can never see the same thing exactly twice. Sure. So it's very fascinating. So people will use that to disc somebody. It's one of those things that they do. They're like, no, because you made this one little mistake. I'm just going to say that you don't know nothing about anything. Right. And that's why it's kind of nice to have definite. This is actually why definitions are so damn important to have yeah. for things like that. Yeah. I know it's a little weird yeah. off deal, but it's, it's communication in this. Things are so important. And I think that's where a lot of people get mixed up. Uh, I've been starting to explain my view on empathy since the Florida stuff's happening because I keep hearing everybody and their mother, well, people need to be more empathetic. It's like, <laughs> empathy is a different thing. It's like, no, you guys are, are, are messing something here. And I literally have studies in empathy on video from great keepers and stuff. So it's like, no, no, stop for a second. Stop for a second. If you hear the person and they actually have, if they're trying to basically filter another person through their own experience, then they have empathy. They just may not be using it correctly. Sure. So that's, I mean, it's, it's as basically as that. So telling them that they have empathy, that they need more empathy means nothing. And it's really fascinating how that works and just working out those kinks of that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do on the rest of the stuff. So this, this type of stuff that I'm doing with you is to learn the laws 
to help people find the data, to help people understand conservation, mm -hmm. to help people with these types of things. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I've been slowly chipping away in an FAQ for the Herb Regs so that What's I don't that? have to answer them, you know, as often that I can just point to the web page. Oh. But oh, FAQ. It's, so, it's so complicated, though. You know, like yeah. I created this dichotomous key from a simple question, can I keep this? And it was a page and a half because it's like, whether it's native, whether it's what's the purpose? Is it for a pet? Is it for research? Is it for exhibition? Like, and um, because there are so many different laws and regulations that don't necessarily contradict them each other, but it would be really hard, I think, for the public to be able to figure out which ones apply to their situation. It's just not laid out in a, in a user. That's just way. legal. That's just every legal guardian. It's a uh, there's a uh, in chemistry, basic chemistry. There's this this map that they do for uh, particle size or something, and it's like this big list, and you have to like write things out in it. And like, it's so daunting and you're like, oh my God, I can't understand any of this. And then when you realize it's adding and subtracting stuff, mm -hmm. but it's just the way they wrote it up. Yeah. It's so, it's like, it's, it's job security. <laughs> That's, I mean, taxes are the exact same thing. It's, it's just job security the way they wrote it up. It's like this stuff is not that oh, complicated. Yeah. And yeah. So when you talk about legal jargon, it's so complicated. Well, and so I think there might be a federal law now, and California just got it too, where as government agencies, we are supposed to write in plain language now. Even our regulations are supposed to be written in plain language. Plain language apparently is like an eighth grade comprehension level. There's clearly no way that so we can do that with our highly people technical. Missouri and Arkansas wouldn't be able to read it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, but but it, but it it is really one of those things where it's hard when you've been writing at a technical level for so long to use more commonly used words that mean the same thing. Uh, there's a professor, um, Dr. Brian Todd at UC Davis now, he's the herpetology instructor. And um, it's like one of his big pet peeves that people use impact for like an adverse effect. And he's like, this is an impact. <laughs> we're talking about effects. Lay people don't think of impacts the way that we're using that. So why do we keep using it? And he's like, why do we say utilize instead of just use? And he was coming up with all these examples. And I'm like, you're right, man. Yeah. It's like, it's like I think in college, they taught us to use big words. So we seem smart. Mm -hmm. But now that's not working for us in terms of science, science communication. I, my boss literally just turned me on to uh, Alan Alded communication. Mm -hmm. That's the guy that played Hawkeye and MASH. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Alan Alda. Yeah. yeah. So he came up with a uh, college for communicating science. Oh, really? That's cool. That's an actual I knew he was, I knew he was really into it into science and stuff. I did not know that. That's really neat. Yeah, and that's like, it's something that I've started looking into because that's what I want to do with a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, and that's, that's where somebody like me does help out a little bit. If we can get past the fact that I don't sound, like I'm a hillbilly scientist. I went to, <laughs> I, I went to college, like I'm basically a high school dropout that went to college at 26 with degrees in physics and chemistry. That's awesome. Yeah, it's weird, but it's like, so when I go to work, I talk to the guards, they call me the lizard 
because they know me. <laughs> the freaking maintenance people, the janitors, the the actual contractors, the the building contractors that are working on the labs next door. Like I'm a I'm a scientist contractor, while they're actually a construction contractor. They know me because I go and bullshit with them because I've. I've cleaned up shit at Walmart's, literally. And that's that's some of the nastiest stuff I've ever seen. And so it's <laughs> – and so, I mean, I just talk to them like the regular people. And when I go to talk to, like, some of these other people, some of the stuff that bothers me the most is that I work with biologists and scientists and stuff. And I will go to them and I go – how do I work this equipment that I've never worked on before? And you guys have been using it for months to years. Yeah. And they're like, I, I don't know. What? <laughs> like what? And then like within a month, I'm like, okay, come here. Come here. See this right here. This shows you that there's a problem. And this is where I'm finding the problem to be is at this little screw right here. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, so when you see this like this, oh, wow, I didn't know that. How long have you been using this machine? Longer than me. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's kind of scary. Yeah. It's a, God, what was it? The, one of the best jokes I've heard was the more I meet pre-meds, the less I trust doctors. <laughs> yeah I see it now I feel like that's not fair <laughs> pre-meds are you know they're young. they're young they're just figuring things out they made my life hell in college though like, oh my god with my degree I still had to take um, like systems classes so uh Systemic physiology was a five unit class and it was all pre-meds in there and some other, you know, science people like me, wildlife biology. And I could not remember all of this stuff. It was so much. It was like, how many of these uh, endocrine systems are triggered if you stub your toe or something, you know, like it's just, it was so wild. I, I, that was my worst class. I got a C plus. I it. had to take organic <laughs> chemistry three times. Oh no. I would have passed it the first time if we would have gotten any credit. Cause every, every multiple choice test, the answer was worth five. And if it was a list, I got it backwards. What do you mean? Okay. Like if it was a list on the multiple choice question, if, if, if it went left to right, I somehow went right to left. Oh, interesting. Well, maybe, I mean, have you been um, evaluated for like dyslexia or anything? I don't have dyslexia. My brain's just weird. It's okay. just weird. Okay. I just, I could go into days. I literally have videos on just the weird shit. But literally, if, if it was a molecule and there was the correct molecule was A and B was like one piece off, literally, I went to the professor a couple of times. I'm like, no, I got the right answer because it says the intermediate. Oh. He goes, no, that's not the intermediate I was wanting, but you're correct. That isn't an intermediate, but that's not the intermediate I was. But yet you either get zero or five. So the, all the pre-meds, you know what? The average... Because that was a class that you have to have as a pre-med. The average for the class was like a 68 on the test. That's how hard those tests were. I and hate it, professors. What well, well, I, I hate them. I hate classes that the average is like a D or an F. I took a, a biochem class that was like that. It's demoralizing. <laughs> It My really first is. Test, I got People like a 55 or something, and that was like an A if you grade, grade it on a curve. Like, what? That's, oh, how are we learning? You're clearly you didn't even, he didn't even grade it on a curve. Yeah, he didn't even grade it on a curve. And so it was really fascinating to see the 
the pre-meds do so poorly, but I kind of understood it. It was a small college, and that was one of the biggest classes of people they had. And so he didn't have help to grade. Mm. So he didn't have really time to do that. Because it's like, if, if you just gave me like two points every time I got one, that was the identical thing, but just one little piece off, I would have passed the very first test. Like yeah. I would have passed it the very first time. Yeah. Because it's, it's, I don't find That's the subject that hard. Oh, I did. And then I made a mistake. I thought that I had to take two quarters of organic chemistry, and it turned out I only needed to do one. So I took a second quarter. <laughs> oh, God. I didn't even need to take. Uh, <laughs> oh. oh, man. I'm telling you, it's amazing I, I made it out alive. <laughs> yeah. This has been awesome. I really appreciate this. Hopefully, you've had fun. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm glad I, it finally worked out. I'm sorry I was having so many problems. And I appreciate you for it. I really do. I, you have led us to an actual better understanding of California and what's actually going on and things we actually need to understand and push forward. So just thank you. I love it when I learn shit. People don't understand that. I'm like, no, I want you to communicate uh, with me. I, I want I mean, you to teach me something. I want to. Yeah. Learn. Learning is if you're if you're not curious and you don't want to learn, I feel like that's sad. Yeah, I, it's just I love learning new things. Like you just taught me about how the heat can mess with Wi-Fi wavelengths. Yeah, that is super cool. A, I mean, it's not cool it was, to ask, but it's cool to know so, about it. I seen a meme earlier, like it was like yesterday, the day before, and somebody wrote a comment. That was so just mind blowingly, just like, yes. It, the meme was something along the lines of asking for help or something. And he goes, okay, asking for help means that you want to be better, that you want to be the best, that you want to grow, that you are actually moving forward and you are being successful, you want to be successful. Living in a world where you believe that you can't ask for help means you just want to be minute. Just you want to be moderate. You don't want to be anything special. You don't want to grow. You don't want to. I think that I think that that can be the case. But I think that yeah. there's also another case where some people feel very ashamed for not knowing. Yeah. And so it took me until I was probably in my mid thirties to be able to say, I don't know, in a professional context, you know, I always felt like I should have the answers. And if I didn't know it, like I would never make anything up, but I would just sort of like start putting things together and, and kind of like thinking about what it might be but it's like, you know, it's sort of informed speculation, but it's still speculation. And now I'm just like, you know what? I'm not really sure, but like, let's look this up. You know, let's yeah. put some stuff together. You know, I tell people, you want to know how you want to know how you can tell I'm intelligent. Like uh, I was at a show once and there was a kid that just kept saying the word venomous. Venomous, 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 venomous. <laughs> and it's like, I, I almost flipped out on him. And I'm like, okay, stop with the venomous. We don't care. That is not the most important thing. See that python that's wrapped around your finger right now? He's not moving. He's experiencing the world from your finger. That, that nonverbal right there is so cool. And... I got upset with myself, even though everybody's like, no, you handled that fantastically. You should be teaching kids stuff. I'm like, I hated that. I felt like I snapped. And you know, yeah. the kid had to have noticed that a little bit, but he still stopped and he took note of what I was doing. So I went and wrote a guy that I know who taught, who, who does uh, educational shows with reptiles. And I'm like, how could I have handled that better? Mm -hmm. That's a sign of intelligence. Absolutely. When it's not enough to just be, even though anybody might go, okay, you're good. No, finding somebody, looking for somebody that are know a topic better than you and looking for answers 
there. That's a sign of intelligence. And it, and I think it's interesting too because it's it's also sort of um, to me uh, it, it's a sign of humility as well. Like you understand that while you may know a lot about things, you shouldn't assume that someone else doesn't know a lot as well. That's just sort of different. And so that's one of the things that has helped me in my job as well, because I deal with some very difficult to deal with people. Yeah. But if I just sit there and listen to them and I can actually learn some things that I, that I didn't know. And if I can honestly, genuinely say, that's really cool. I didn't know that. And yeah. you know, like, that makes them feel good. Whatever tension we have breaks down a little bit. My and Beardy Mom was, episode's actually about this hot topic. What it, What was? My Beardy Mom episode. Oh, okay. Because I tell everybody I am a Beardy Mom. <laughs> and the, in the industry, there's a lot of people who use that as a derogatory. Oh, really? It's a Beardy Mom. And so it's like, no, when you ask a Beardy Mom what they have learned, from being a beardy mom, you might actually learn something. And yeah. if you don't, you can teach them something. So if you actually feel that it's a bad thing, like if they put clothes on reptiles, I'm not a fan of that myself, but I don't do it, but other people do. But if you just ask them what they've learned because they own a beardy, it changes everything. Yeah. Like the excitement that this girl has, like you can just see that. It's really fascinating. And I've been getting on to people now for using the word common sense. Oh, yeah. Because it's 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 just a word that you use as a placeholder to say everybody should know what I know. Right. That's the way it's used. And it's like, no, you got to get over that. The only one thing in this world that I have found that you can say is possibly common sense is pooping. Poopy? Poopy. <laughs> If you, if you really think about it, you think any age, any person should have an understanding of poopy. Right. Yes. Well, like the bodily function. So there's not a whole lot to it. I would say the, uh, you know, people could argue wiping after you poop is common sense. But, That's why uh, I don't use wiping. But yet, because there's people who don't wipe. And, you don't have to wipe. And now a lot of people don't. Pick up bidets, you know? I, I, I will recommend a bidet all day long. It takes a I couple of hours to get used to it, but it's it's fantastic. I want one so bad. You can get them to where they just fit on your toilet. Yeah, but I want a fancy one. For about $40 that does that does multiple things. Huh. I'll have to look at you. Absolutely must. Yeah. And it takes it. I, I get used to things quicker than most do, so it took me about three days to get used to it. But once you do it, for yeah. once you do it for a couple of weeks, it does become normal. Mm -hmm. Once you go back to wiping, it's like it's barbaric. Yeah. <laughs> no. Someone likened it to like if you needed to get dog poo off of your shoe, would you use water or paper? Yes. <laughs> I'm like. That is a very good point. And the freshness that you feel. And when you're sick, oh my God. Oh. Yeah, I bet. Because I try to use like, uh, you know, the, the earthy toilet paper. And I'll tell you, that stuff hurts after well, a, a few yeah. wipes. It, yeah. I was like, I, I actually read a review for, I'm not going to name the brand. That would be too mean. But Let's, I was like, this stuff is like sandpaper on my butt. Do you, do you watch South Park? I have watched. I haven't watched any re recently. There's an episode about the toilet paper industry, and he goes and buys this fancy bidet. And he's fighting, like, no, this actually saves us conservation, and this saves us money, saves us time. It saves all these different things, having a fancy toilet. In the episode, he gets shot because of the toilet paper cartel. <laughs> so at the end of the episode, he's like, no, 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 no. Toilet paper's great. Let's move on, Stan. Let's move on, Stan. And it's like, 
Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so so let's let's be careful now. <laughs> yeah. You know what's sad is like there's so much truth in so many things that they say on that show. Yes. I mean, yeah. You know is, why we have it the is not the far from that, especially yeah. with you know, all the dark money in politics that can, oh. you know. Do you know why we have the, quote, flushable wipes? Uh, They're not actually flushable, but your car right. keys are flushable. So legally, you can flush it kind of thing. It's like that. It's because the their, their profits plateaued. They were still making a profit, but it plateaued. Oh, so they needed something new and shiny. Yeah. 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 No, it's it's one of those things. But I've had a wonderful time. Is there anything else you want to tell people to kind of let them know? In California in particular, water conservation is very important. So I would say to the extent that you can conserve water, like uh, if it's yellow, let it mellow kind of. Um, changing your landscape. I mean, honestly, I have not zero scaped my yard and I have not watered it since 2014. And interestingly, a lot of my neighbors are snap now like letting their yards go brown in the summer as well. So I feel a little bit better about it. Um, but I think also, oh, what I was gonna say about the Fish and Game Commission is, um, Right, like, so I, I think obviously the more people participate in our government, the better things are going to be. So one way that they can have like affect things directly with fish and wildlife um, is getting involved in any kind of like regulations if they're interested. Obviously you don't have to do all of it, but if there's a topic that you're really interested in, I think that that would be a good way to get into it. And then also, I think just um, letting your representatives know what you value. And it almost takes a tragedy for people to come out. But what we've seen in what's been Florida all around the world has come out in support of keepers and stuff. So this is the topics of animals is far more important than legislation gives it credit. And it's really fascinating. I saw a job opportunity the other day in Maine oh. for a biologist, for a part-time biologist thing. It was like $12 and like 40 cents. Oh my gosh. In Maine. Oh. Okay, I'm like, that's, I make more than that. Of course yeah, I, was, I've been working in this in this for the state for 27 years so you you would hope <laughs> when the guy at target makes more than you yeah. for doing conservation work then we might have start having an issue but they tar people at target should be making more but that does mean the conservation people should be making even more it, you know what and what it comes down to is like i'm not gonna be getting into some you know big economic argument or whatever yeah. but i mean this is capitalism this is recruitment and retention and because people are really passionate about doing this job we stick with it while we're beat up and underpaid overworked because we care so much about it and they know that and they take advantage of it and so often in this industry, we see fish and wildlife being villainized. When it's like, this yeah. is the one of the biggest reasons I have to have people on to show that you are a human, that you actually give a shit. Oh, yeah. And it's like, yes, this is this is some of the most important things with what I do right here is to show that you guys are actually did this for a reason because you actually care. Oh yeah, for sure. And I don't, I haven't had a single person on who doesn't care. Even yeah. if they're not even a herpetologist and they're just the fish and wildlife person, 
but they do burn out just like anybody else. Yeah. They often don't take their work home because it's a job. It becomes a job. It becomes bureaucratic. And we all, none of us want to be bureaucrats. So when you look at a bureaucrat, and this is something that I, I nobody watched that video, but it's, it's normal people do some of the most horrendous shit. And the most, one of the more important things than empathy is who you spend time with. So if you're spending time with somebody, with people that do not care, mm. and you're not pushing them to care, then you're being led to not care. Yeah. It's, who it's, you uh, it's hard with? sometimes because it's hard to always have something sort of like positive to talk about because so much of what I do, it's like such a, a downer, you know, constantly responding to like uh, tadpoles of an endangered frog or something stranded because of a drought. Uh, Western pond turtles, same thing, like always trying to figure out if we have the capacity to rescue them. And if we do, where do we even put them? I mean, what do we do with that? And that's so- the, okay. That's the other question that I'm missing. I thought there might've been one. Since the, we talked a little bit about it, since all the massive snows and rain, how has that been effective on your conservation and what could anybody do to help? Well, so that's, you know, that's one of the reasons I, I mentioned um, uh, water conservation. The other thing is, as I mentioned, like, as we keep moving our uh, development out into wildlands, we're going to come in conflict with more wildlife. And so I would urge do you know what nimby means have you heard nimby no it's an acronym for not in my backyard okay and californians are awful about this it's and not happening in my backyard doesn't matter and so there's actually a counter movement called yimby yes in my backyard and so one of the things that you can do is encourage your local governments to infill and you know or, or raise buildings and then build taller ones and try to get more high density um housing in areas so that we don't keep spreading out because i know people don't like seeing wildlife hurt or have to be shot but that's exactly what happens people hate it when our wardens have to go after bears or mountain lions or anything, you know? And it's like, well, don't leave the cat food out. That's another thing. Subsidize predators. Actually, one of the best things that you can do is secure your trash and not put food out for wildlife because raccoons will do a number on snow. <laughs> yes. They are so cute, but deadly. Yes. So, you know, just try to have, a, you know, a smaller footprint in carbon, whatever, and also just kind of like be aware of unintended consequences of some of the things that you're doing. You might think, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm helping the wildlife because I'm feeding the raccoons. Well, those raccoons are gonna go and eat like everything they can. It's not like they filled up on your cutie food. They're just gonna have bigger litters and they're gonna get bigger and live longer and they're still gonna be eating everything else that they can get their hands on. Some of my thoughts on, on the topic of some of the weather issues that California's having right now is the understanding that most national disasters don't just get fixed in a week. 
that's for sure. And I mean, so yeah, this, that's the other thing. I mean, I, I don't know if you- The flooding that we had a year ago, we're still messing with that in St. Peter's now. Yeah. We're still trying to work on houses there. Yeah, of course. And it's, it, it is very expensive. It, it would be so much more cost effective, efficient, if we were proactive about building around how climate change is actually impacting, oops, affecting <laughs> uh, our, our, you know, our infrastructure. Because one of the things that's going to be really, really scary about the amount of precipitation that we had, and it got warm so fast. So the snow melt is going to be really problematic. It, it might be good in some areas where we had wildfires and we didn't get enough rain to actually scour out all of the debris that had entered the, the pond, you know, it entered the streams. And so like pond turtles lost their habitat, or frogs, salamanders, it was all just, you know, filled in with, with stuff that had come off of the mountains. And so it'll definitely get scoured out now. But the other thing is, if it's too sort of like severe uh, a flood, it's gonna knock all those animals that are still there out too. And so that's the problem with these extremes where we had all these wildfires, we had drought, we didn't have enough water to flush things out. And now we've got so much that the animals can't recover in this and yeah. we can't recover them either. Like, because the habitat keeps getting chopped up and stuff, they can't move around the landscape the way they did. Now we have to sort of do assisted migration or one of the things that California is working on a lot now is, um, trying to create connectivity across major barriers. So we just got like, a, I guess a new law and some new money. They're putting together guidelines on how to implement it, but we should see more like wildlife crossings in California in the future, which is great. But at the same time, we also have to like be more thoughtful about where we're gonna put roads and and try to really um, understand wildlife movement corridors and and if there are certain like migration routes or something and just avoid those, you know, instead of cutting this off. Because it's not only bad for wildlife, it's bad for people when they hit the wildlife. I just wanted, I think we're gonna end it really, because I'm, Two I'm hours, and hours. I'm like, yeah. I didn't feel. Did you feel like it's been two hours? No. <laughs> no, this has been fun. Yeah. I just, I want to leave off. I'm from the Joplin area, and in 2011 we had the hurt, the tornado. I, I actually believe the the tornado in Joplin was caused by the earthquake in Japan. Oh. Really fascinating how that works. I love shock value. And then to bring something where people go, oh, oh, like what? Oh, oh, that actually makes sense. Oh, so yeah. if you stop the earth, you get thousands of miles per hour wind everywhere at once. Hmm. The earthquake in Japan that year slowed the earth down by 0 0.03 of a second. Really? It did. It was so big that wow. it actually slowed the earth down. Uh -huh. So when you're talking about chaos theory, you talk about equilibrium. So you think of it as a radio dial. And if you're moving along, you find a channel that has actual sound. That's good. That's an equilibrium. Further you move or you change the station, you start getting the static. And you have to find the equilibrium again. That tornado season, right after that, everything seemed to be moved west and was huh. increased. Joplin tornado was right at the end of that. We're used to getting F1s on the outskirts of Joplin and over towards Oklahoma. We were not used to getting an F5 wow. in Joplin. So I believe the earthquake in Japan caused a tornado in Joplin because of the noise. The hurricane season right after that was normal. Hmm. 
because it found its equilibrium. Right. But the takeaway also here is that there were so many old houses and stuff in Joplin. Joplin was run down. Joplin mm. was not a place. After you get the big highway in Joplin, literally there was the, the Cars movie talked about it. That was the whole point of Cars that I happened to Joplin. I haven't seen it. Well, it's just the fact that the major highways went through and it oh. destroyed small towns. Mm -hmm. That that happened to Joplin. But now, because of that, they have new hospitals. They actually have a surgical college. Everybody got new houses because of the insurance. It actually grew Joplin and brought in businesses oh, and cleaned good. up a lot of Joplin because of tragedy. Right. So in every tragedy, we can. This is why we're hoping that the tragedy that happened to those pythons in Florida leads us in the future to actually increasing positivity. Yeah. Every tragedy is just a chance for a positive future. It's a nice way to look at things. Yeah. I think that's the best An way opportunity for for I mean it's 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 forced change on you, but I guess it's yeah. like you say, it's an opportunity. You can kind of choose the path in some ways. And that goes back to Mandy, right? Not in my backyard or whatever that is. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nim Nimby's. Mindy's. Yeah. Mindy's. Yeah, it goes back to Mindy's. Not in my backyard. Well, once you have that tragedy, you're forced into your backyard. Yeah. Yeah, it's forced upon you. You don't get a choice. And so and exactly. And that's why... Um, instead of just digging your heels in and obstructing what could be positive growth, smart growth, yeah. be part of the solution, yeah. you may end up getting more than you would by just not being part of the issue. And then you're going to get it forced upon you. Yeah. And so being collaborative, being humble, listening to other people, understanding their needs, our needs, is, the, I think, the only way that we, like, survive as a species, yeah. you know? Because if we just keep digging in and digging in, it's going to get, you know, so much worse. And in, like, every category of life, right? Yeah. That's so. exactly what's going to happen. And... It really is. It's it's so with every tragedy, there's an opportunity, and let's hopefully this this tragedies that's happened in California. Hopefully, we can advance that into a positivity in some way. I definitely hope so. So, thank you so much for being on. Sure, this is actually wildly helpful, and it's been fun. Yeah. And these talks are things that we need because it's been so stressful with the stuff happening in Florida. Mm -hmm. and stuff even though i don't live there like i'm trying to be part of it and it's massively stressful and these last couple of conversations i've had with people the beardy mom episode and you have just been wonderful okay. it's been taking away from that stress and positive stuff so thank you so much you're welcome I'm glad we were able to make it happen oh yeah i'm actually very happy like there was a minute they're going damn it this isn't going to happen tonight because of the, yeah, it's crap. Like, ah, no, great. Thank you so much. You're now welcome. I, I've got to pee. I've had to pee for like an hour. Okay. <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Thanks.